Okay, so we can start. It's my great pleasure to introduce tonight uh, David Siegel. He's a faculty member. Um, didn't uh, like him like the medicine. He's also a member of the Genome Center. Uh, the Genome Center was put together in 2003 to provide sort of genomic approaches to the whole campus. And we recruited then uh, some faculty with different expertises to provide leadership in genomics. Dave's expertise is sort of genome modification, which we may talk a little bit about. Uh, he's Sorry. Oh, you, you won't be talking to the microphone. Okay. So Dave's expertise is in genome modification. We're beginning to get to the point where if we want to change the DNA sequence, we can indeed do that. There's some challenges, but it's a very, very exciting area. Uh, but tonight, he's going to talk more about the uh, impact of genomics on human health. This is quite a, a, an exciting area. It's moving incredibly fast. Uh, we have trouble keeping up with what's happening. It's very, very exciting. Um, what we can do, we can project forward a few years, four or five years, and we didn't even have the vocabulary for that five years ago. And I think he's going to talk some pretty amazing statistics and project forward. I'm sure he's very happy to take questions as we go along too. So if he says anything particularly outrageous, <laughs> Stick, stick your hand up and we can debate. You know, the whole idea of these um, sessions is to have a discussion rather than just a straight lecture. This is actually the second lecture. The first one we had about a year ago on um, microbe, the microbes. Jonathan Eisen to told us how uh, actually microbes rule the world, not, uh, not us. <laughs> and uh, we're very happy, though, to have other, um, other talks. You know, if you, there are particular things you'd like to hear in the biological arena, particularly sort of relating to genomics. We'd uh, happy to have your suggestions and keep going. So anyway, my great pleasure to introduce Dave. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for coming out on this Saturday evening. I know that we were competing with Shrek in the park, and I appreciate you coming here. <laughs> I know you have a choice of entertainment venues, haven't you know? But tonight, uh, I want to talk to you about genomics and health. So, as uh, Dr. Mitchell Moore said, I'm uh, um, in the Genome Center at UC Davis. I'm actually the Associate Director of Genomics. And uh, our Genome Center is uh, trying to um, en enable genomic uh, research at UC Davis. So, uh, some of the things that I'm going to be talking about are, require a lot of uh, instrumentation some of which is very expensive and very technically advanced. And so it's hard for individual researchers to do this on their own. And so that's what the Genome Center is there to do. Um, and so we try to do that. And why is that, why are, is this interesting? So I just, the main thing I'd like to you to take away from tonight is that we're in the midst of a kind of revolution in genomics now. Uh, for people that are in this field, you get the impression that the world is just changing rapidly under your feet. So just to give you an idea of that, okay, the first human genome was sequenced um, sometime in the early 2000s uh, at a cost of $3 billion. It was a 13-year effort uh, involving people from many different countries. I remember when I was a graduate student, and this was still in front of us, and they were saying, well, we'll take the best labs, maybe 30 years, you know, to sequence all this DNA. Um, and then with some advances in technology, it actually came along a little bit faster than we thought it would. Uh, but that was still $3 billion and, and very big. Uh, that was about, find the final draft was released around here. Just a few years later, the first individual person's genome was sequenced. So the, the genome that was sequenced out here was a kind of average genome. We call that the reference genome, okay? But if I want to know about my personal risk of disease or what my genome has in store for me, we have to sequence my genome. So the first individual person's genome to be sequenced uh, was just a few years later. That only cost $300 million. Now I say only, you know, I wish I had $300 million. But, you know, it's already tenfold less. Um, just a few years later, more than 16 people have had their individual genomes sequenced. Um, and that was at about the end of the last decade. By now, it's estimated that there's probably about 10,000 individual genomes that have been sequenced. The cost of a, of a genome, at least equipment-wise, is down to about $1,000. So that's a, like a 300,000-fold reduction in cost. 
This blue line is the famous Moore's Law, which talks about the cost of computing. This idea that the, cost of trans the amount of transistors you could put on a chip doubles every 18 months or something. As you can see, the cost of genome sequencing is faster now than Moore's Law. We're, we're evolving, genome sequencing is evolving faster than computers are. So this is giving us a window on, on DNA sequence and on understanding how this blueprint of life relates to our health. We can ask questions now that even three years ago we couldn't ask. And so it's having big impacts. And there's going to be a lot more to come. I can see it's, some text is up there, but it's okay. <laughs> I'll tell you what it says. Um, it says there's a lot more to come. So this is just one example. Uh, UC Davis has partnered with a sequencing company called BGI. BGI is the largest sequencing entity on the planet. They have the capacity to sequence about 2,000 complete human genomes every day, if that's what they wanted to do. So, you know, there's big estimations about what, what you know, kind of sequencing is coming. We've already seen, you know, what's, what's here, but there's going to be a lot more coming. And, you know, they don't just sequence people. This is also going into agriculture, microbial world, lots of other things, too. But tonight we'll just talk about people. And the technology is changing, too. So the reason that the, pr the price is coming down is technology is changing, new equipment comes online. Things that we never really thought would, could be a way to sequence, people are sequencing this way now. This is one of the latest types of devices. This one's not even on the market yet, but it's very anticipated. Um, I don't know if you could see it very well. It's a small device. Obviously, it fits in the hand. And it, it plugs into a USB port on a computer. And it's thought, you know, the manufacturer claims that you could just add in a kind of raw sample into this. It will do all the processing and, uh, and give you sequence information um, for about $700. And uh, a set of machines that are kind of like this, they say, will soon be able to sequence an entire human genome in about 15 minutes for $150. Now, you know, that's easy to say. They haven't done that yet. But you can see things are going in this direction, okay? So, and then, as if that's not uh, pressure enough, uh, now there's even direct-to-consumer companies that are selling this directly to people. And, uh, you know, this is a... This, this is a, another thing that, uh, as researchers, you know, we have to think um, this information is going to be out there uh, that people are going to be able to access it very easily. They won't have to enroll in a big study at a university. Uh, they can have this information given to them kind of on their own. And many people are doing this. Um, and, you know, they, uh, for some low price, uh, they can give you a lot of information about your genome. And like Kirk C. says here, um, because I had given my doctor information from 23andMe, he was able to diagnose, get a diagnosis much faster. 23andMe saved my life. And one of the things that they suggest that you do with this information is to keep your doctor informed and find out your genetic risk. Now, I also teach in the School of Medicine. And I can tell you that when I talk to doctors, um, we're really unsure what to do with this information, a lot of it. And uh, so I'm going to talk about that tonight, too. But certainly the genie is coming out of the bottle. It's not going to be contained uh, in the ivory towers of universities. It's not going to be decided by a panel of bioethicists what kind of information people are going to be able to get. They're going to get it. And now we have to deal with that. Um, that's where we're moving. So. So this is uh, a diagram of what we'd call the central dogma of biology, uh, that there's DNA that makes RNA that makes protein. You could think of the DNA kind of like a library. Uh, and the books in the library are, are instruction manuals. And these instruction manuals never leave the library, so they get copied um, into RNA. And, uh, and then this RNA gets converted into protein. And the protein is either the enzymes and the machines that make, do things in our cells or at least they make parts of, of cells, like lipid membranes. Or, well, maybe not that, but other things. <laughs> um, and so all the genes in, the gene, in, in our cells is referred to as the genome and the field of genomics. All the RNA transcripts is actually called the transcriptome, 
but this is highly related to the epigenome that kind of controls which of these genes are on. And all the proteins in the cell are the proteome. And so in the genome center, we actually work on all these different levels. We work uh, on the genome level that I'll talk about tonight. But it's not just genes, there's also uh, gene expression, um, and we, we work on that. And we also have uh, proteomics facilities that work on proteins, and then we even have a metabolomics facility that uh, just looks at the small molecules that are in the blood and, and other tissues. So we could think of the genome as maybe the repository of all possible genetic information. And uh, only some of this will be active in any particular cell. Um, and depending on which of these uh, genes are active uh, gives the cells different functions. So a nerve cell will express different genes than a muscle cell. And that'll be expressed as different proteins. So that's kind of the big picture of where things are going. Now there's a lot of DNA in our cells. So here's a question that I like to ask my students. Okay, if all the DNA in one cell of your body was stretched end to end, how long would it be? Okay, so all the DNA in one cell of your body. So how many people, do a show of hands, how many people say it's two millimeters long? All the DNA in your cell. How about two centimeters long? For people that are not used to the metric systems, about that much. <laughs> how about two meters long? Two kilometers long? Two kilometers is, you know, pushing up on a mile. Um, it would wrap almost one time around the whole Earth. How many people? Yeah. This is the most common answer. It's not true. <laughs> it's the wrong answer. That's what the medical students say too, uh, at least before my test. Um, the answer is actually two meters. Each cell has two meters of DNA. I think that's actually pretty impressive in itself. You take a cell that you can't even see with your eye, and it has this much DNA in it if you put it end to end. Now, in this case, what if you took all the trillions of cells in your body? It's estimated there's 100 trillion cells in your body. Now, if you took all that DNA, that would wrap w one time around the Earth. In fact, it would reach all the way to the moon and back 100,000 times. That's in your body. So think about that when people talk about long nerves or long muscles. Ha, <laughs> that's nothing. So. If I was making the genome, um, I would arrange it like a library. I'd put the books on the shelves snug up against each other. In fact, that's not what our genome looks like. Uh, there's mostly space between these genes. And in fact, only about 2% of the DNA in our cells actually codes for protein. So what is the other 98% of stuff that's in our, our DNA? So after the human genome was sequenced, and maybe you know, a little bit before that, uh, we were able to get a better picture of that. So one thing that, uh, that takes up a lot of space are so-called introns. So the parts that code for protein are these things called exons, that's shown in yellow, and then there's some, some DNA between them. And this DNA is, uh, eventually leaves when we make the RNA, and uh, that makes the eventual protein. So again, I like to think about each gene as an instruction manual. And these introns are kind of like stuff stuck between the pages of the instruction manual. And actually what I'm trying to tell you is it's mostly the stuff that makes up these, these genes. Um, the regions that actually code for the proteins it can be very small. We'll see an example of that later. So introns is about a quarter of it. Another quarter of the DNA uh, has parts on it that that basically give information for which genes should be on at what time. We call them regulatory sequences. And we're learning a lot about regulatory elements and regulatory sequences and how they tell which genes to turn on when in response to stimulus and things like that. So that's a lot of the DNA as well. But almost half of the DNA is what we call repetitive DNA. Repeated sequences. Some of them are very long, some of them are just a couple of nucleotides. Now why it's like that, I don't know. You'll have to ask my boss. But most of the DNA is, uh, is this repetitive sequence, uh, and only a little bit of it codes for proteins. So now that the human genome has been sequenced, we know that there's about 3 billion base pairs of DNA, and we know that there's about 26,000 genes. And we also know from now sequencing many different people 
that all of our DNA is about 99.5% identical. So everyone in this room, you could think that you're 99.5% identical to the person next to you. So we're really close. And this cuts across all races, all ethnic groups, everyone around the globe. Very similar. I mean, almost base for base, exactly the same. Same genes, right? Um, but this little bit that's left over from the three billion still makes millions of genetic differences. And those account for you know, things that we all know are different between us, things like height, eye color, and skin color. Um, but also some things maybe that we're less comfortable thinking about <laughs> that might be due to genetics or have some genetic component to it, you know, at least. Now, when I put that up, I used to say, um, you can imagine that before too long, given the tools that we have available, uh, someone will start to think about how do the genes control intelligence. But I can tell you now, there's people already looking at this. I know that there are. There's a project actually to sequence 100 people with an IQ of like 150. And so another genie is going to come out of the bottle. And again, you know, society now has to deal with this because the answers are coming. So, so this is why we want to engage, you know, people in our community um, to see these things happen. Some of these genetic differences will change the way that people metabolize drugs. And then some of them will affect our susceptibility to different diseases. And it's this last part that I really want to talk about uh, now. So this says genetic variation and disease. So variants, and when I say variant, I'm just talking about a difference in somebody's genome from, let's say, the reference genome. It could be a single base, it could be a big deletion, it could be an insertion, it could be um, whatever it is. Many variants are inherited. That means they come from our parents, and our parents probably had them. Where they started, you know, may go way back. So we inherit some variations from our parents. That's why most of us look a little bit like our parents. Um, and then some of them are what we call de novo, which means that the parents don't have them, they just arise in the child. And in thinking about how frequently you see variations, um, this graph is kind of, uh, this diagram is kind of informative, okay? So, um, there might be some, uh, some variations that only a few people have, or there could be variants that everybody has. So, for example, in this room, maybe at some position I have a G and someone else has a C, and, you know, that's very common, so maybe half the people will have a G and half the people will have a C at that position. So that's what I mean by frequent. Uh, Rare is something like only one person, so everybody would normally have a G at that position, and one person has a C. That's rare. Now, the effect, uh, and th this is dogma too, right? The effect, it, the idea is that uh, rare variants will probably have more of an effect on disease, and common variants probably have less of a, an effect on disease. So the greatest effect that a variant could have is death, okay? so. We'll see, there's about you know, 26,000 genes. We know of about 3,000 Mendelian disorders, single gene disorders. That is, diseases that when a single gene is mutated, it causes a disease. Now, we don't have 26,000 genetic diseases. That's probably because a lot of genes are not, let's say, spare parts. That they're essential, and that when you mutate them, they're not compatible with life. So, uh, so those would be rare, very rare variants, because essentially you'd never see them. Those, uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have variants that have apparently no effect. So I said some people may have a G in some positions, some may have a C. For all we know, maybe some of those things have no effect. Maybe most of those variants have no effect, especially the common ones. So disease is thought to arise for variations that are in here. And again, they range from rare variants that might have a large effect on disease to common variants that might have less of an effect on disease, but perhaps be additive or something like that. So monogenic disorders, single gene disorders, like I said, there's about 6,000 of them, something like that. They usually have to do with rare variants with a large effect on disease. Um, and we could think that they have a limited environmental component. And this is important when you try to make a prediction based on someone's genome about whether they're going to have a disease. So here's some examples um, of some uh, single gene disorders, things like uh, neurofibromatosis, uh, sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis, 
Fragile X syndrome. These are things that many people have heard of. And these are all due to mutations in a single gene. And so if you did a genome scan of somebody and you saw a mutation in the gene responsible for cystic fibrosis, you would say that person's going to have cystic fibrosis. And you could say that with high, high probability because uh, there's not a, a large environmental impact. You know, it doesn't matter what they eat. They're going to get this disease. But, you know, if you add all these numbers together, they only come out to about 1% of all births. And these are the top, the top uh, genetic diseases. Diseases that affect most people are things like disease of the heart, there's malignant neoplasms, that's cancer, cardiovascular disease, or that's cere cerebrovascular disease. Yeah, that's like stroke, um, chronic lower respiratory disease, accidents, I don't know, accidents. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if there's a genetic component to accidents. There might be. We have to study that better. So, so these are what we call common complex diseases. And we know for sure there's no one gene that causes things like heart disease. Um, there are some rare variants that when mutated will cause heart disease, but that's not what most people get. Okay, most people don't have like a single mutation and that gives them heart disease. They have a number of, well, actually we're trying to figure out what they have. But we know that they don't just have one. Um, it's thought that there are many variants and each one has a small effect. And it was thought for a while that maybe you could add these variants together and they should add up to give you a very good prediction about disease. So what are some of these common variants? So the most common variant, and the only one I'm going to focus on tonight, are the so-called single nucleotide polymorphisms, but you could just call them SNPs. So what that is, is you know, if these are two different people's genomes, like I say, you're going along and someone has a C in this position, somebody else has a G, you're over here, someone has an A, someone has a T. Usually it's just a choice of two. And for common variants, there's about 34 million of these things that we know of, and most people, uh, for their common variants, they're all, these positions are known. So that's a single nucleotide polymorphism, it's just a change. So here's some SNPs uh, superimposed on a diagram of this gene. This is the BRCA1 gene, which some people might have heard, BRCA1. It's involved in breast cancer. And uh, these uh, lines, these vertical lines are actually exons, if you remember that. This is a big exon. This uh, jumpy line in, in the middle is the introns. You can see the introns are much larger than the exons, like I said. And here's the SNPs. And you can see the SNPs show up all over the place. They show up in introns, they show up in exons. Uh, we're not showing regulatory sequences, but they show up in regulatory sequences. Now you could imagine that a SNP that occurs in a coding region could disrupt that coding region. It could cause a different amino acid to go there. It could cause a premature truncation. It could have a big effect on whatever this protein does. SNPs that are out here, a little harder to say. A little harder to say. Now here we've zoomed in just on that big exon, that protein coding region. I just want to make a few points about this. So um, what they're showing are these same SNPs. Okay, so here's a SNP. Some people have a C, some people have a T. And now they looked at three different four different populations. This is a European population, Chinese population, Japanese, and uh, Nigerian African population. And this shows the frequency of these, these two uh, SNP states. So in these three populations, about two-thirds to three-quarters of the people have a C. A minority has a T. But look at this African population. Almost everybody has a T. And not many people have a C. Okay? Here's another case, right? About same kind of distribution. You know, two-thirds, three-quarters of these populations have an A. Oh, here, only a minority of people have an A. Most people have a C. Now this SNP actually occurs in this coding region. So now this is a candidate and say, hey, maybe this base change is going to change an amino acid. Maybe it's going to change something in this gene. And so looking at this data now, you could ask the question, do people that normally have a T have an increased risk or decreased risk to getting breast cancer? Now I don't know the answer to that, but now that you have this window on this, now you can start to ask those kinds of questions, right? So now we can start to look at different SNP patterns in different populations. 
And in fact, um, you know, if you looked at enough of these, you could actually use this to determine your ancestry. Um, so if you had this SNP as a T and this SNP as a C, uh, there's, you know, an increased likelihood that that person would be from African descent. And so if you have, look at a thousand of these, uh, you could have a fair amount of confidence that that would be true. And in fact, uh, 23andMe, which is just one of the companies that does direct-to-consumer testing, um, this is a service that they offer, is to find your ancestry. They even have a Facebook-like interface down here that once you put your DNA in and other people put their DNA in, you, they try to match you up with people that have similar SNP patterns and say, you know, you might be able to find your, your eighth cousin twice removed, or I don't know how that goes, but, you know, someone very far away, your eighth cousin or something like that. And uh, so you can learn a, a lot about ancestry as well uh, by looking at, at the gen genetics, which again could be a good thing, could be a bad thing, but that's where we're going in society now. So um, there's a, a lot of cultures uh, don't like this, are, are concerned about this kind of information uh, and what it might say about their own ancestry. Um, so that's something we need to think about. And of course, other people will try to match up particular SNP patterns with uh, health outcomes and disease. So for example, in this study, they took um, 2,000 people that had, say, coronary artery disease and 3,000 people that didn't have coronary artery disease. They looked at 500,000 SNPs all the way across their DNA. And they looked for ones, they looked for SNPs, some kind of pattern anywhere um, where there were certain SNPs that were more highly associated with getting the disease that showed up in people that had the disease but didn't really show up in people that didn't have the disease. And so the idea is if there were some SNPs that were more associated with people that had the disease, maybe that is a gene involved in the disease. Maybe it, you can estimate some kind of risk, predict who's going to get the disease. That was the hope. So they did this kind of study and they found some genetic loci, some genetic positions that did seem to be important for these diseases. By now, there's been you know, more than 1,500 of these studies done. They've identified over 2,000 different SNP patterns that are involved in many different kinds of traits uh, and many different kinds of diseases. And so, you know, this in a sense is, is progress. You know, we're able to uh, understand now how our genetics relates to disease in a way that we never could before. Unfortunately, what we've learned from this giant exercise is that um, it's not that simple. It's not that simple. Um, so here's uh, some information from some diseases and traits uh, that came out of these kind of large-scale studies. So here, if we look at macular degeneration, now this is a good example of kind of where we would like to be. So they found three different, uh, let's say loci, but let's say genetic positions. Maybe they're in genes, maybe they're in regulatory regions, something like that. But just three of these different variants accounted for 50% of the inherited amount of this, uh, of this disease. So with just these three pieces of information, you could make a good prediction about what was going to happen. You could maybe research these very carefully, try to understand the biochemical pathways that they affect, and maybe you could come up with treatments, right? That's why that was the hope with the sequencing the human genome, right? That we we're going to lead to better treatments. Okay, but more frequently, you see things like this, type 1 diabetes. They found 41 positions, 41 different variants, and those things only account for about 60%. So still a lot of the disease explained, but a lot of positions. Let's jump down here to height. <laughs> now height, height is something that we knew before there was ever any genetics. You know, the best predictor if you were going to be tall was if you came from tall parents. <laughs> Gregor Mendel started, the father of genomics, was making tall pea plants and short pea plants and crossing them. He was looking at height, okay? So we know that height is related to genetics. We know it. We know it. But when they looked at what is controlling height, they found 180 different, different pieces of information around the genome. 
and that only explained 12 percent of, of height. That's very discouraging. And other, you know, other kinds of common diseases are in this category where, you know, there might be, you know, 70 to, to almost 100 different locations where we found some information, but it doesn't explain all of the disease. It's not enough to make a good prediction yet. So, so now we're back to looking at, um, at rare variants. We're back to studying family trees. We have now the power of genomics behind us. But uh, uh, we still have a long way to go in many areas. And so, um, so there is a lot of value of genetic information in health. And, uh, but you have to think about it in different categories now, perhaps. So I like to suggest that genetic information uh, can fall into one of three categories. Uh, actionable, deterministic, or probabilistic. And I suppose the fourth one is of unknown clinical significance, as the clinicians like to say. Um, so I won't go over this list, but I'll show you some uh, s special e examples. So um, surely uh, m uh, single gene disorders that we talked about, monogenic diseases, Mendelian disorders, these things are certainly uh, informative. Um, so uh, this is a graph that's showing the number of um, genetic tests that are available for different diseases. Uh, as of 2009, there were about 2,000 of these. So I said there was maybe 3,000 or 6,000 uh, genetic diseases. I'm talking about single gene disorders. And there's genetic tests for a lot of these. Now these genetic tests often run about, I don't know, something like $1,000 or something in that range. Uh, today, you can look at all the genes in the genome, all the DNA coding region, all the protein coding regions in the genome for about $1,000. So whereas these individual genetic tests tell you about like, you know, the gene that causes cystic fibrosis, you could find out about that plus all the other, all the other genes uh, for about the same cost today. But um, certainly trying to understand, you know, genetic disease, people that are carriers for disease, this kind of thing. Uh, genetics and genomics is very good at that. And in fact, most states uh, screen newborns for about 10 to 30 different genetic diseases, uh, mostly congenital uh, defects and metabolic disorders, mostly things that you've never heard of, unless you're in the clinical field. Um, and so using some of this genomic technology, you see more and more in the literature that people are able to uh, diagnose, make new diagnoses uh, based on this so-called next generation sequencing. Um, so I work with people at the Mind Institute at UC Davis. They see uh, children usually with, um, with mental impairments. Sometimes they understand what that is, sometimes they don't. And a lot of those might have a genetic cause. So they talk to the geneticist and the geneticist will try their best to think about, you know, working with this person, what disease might they have. And based on that, they'll say, you know, I think this gene might be involved. And they'll send out for a genetic test on that gene, $1,000. That might come back negative, And they'll say, well, OK, it wasn't that, but I think it's this other thing. So they'll send out for another genetic test. Meanwhile, time is passing. Money is going. You know, with this kind of thing, um, you could screen all of these genes. And, and that's what people are doing and uh, able to make diagnoses uh, of this type uh, a lot faster, but not without its problems uh, that I'll get back to. Um, so that's, that's developing more and more in, in the clinic. Sequencing is moving into the clinic now, little by little. Um, then there's complex disease. This says complex disease breast cancer. So uh, there's a famous genetic test, famous because uh, it was the first uh, clinical genetic test, I think, it, uh, for breast cancer, for cancer, uh, looks at the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene. It's also famous because uh, the makers of this test were sued in court by the ACLU. They took it all the way to the Supreme Court. And what they were, what they were suing was uh, Myriad Genetics that makes this genetic test said, we patented this gene. And if UC Davis sequences this gene and wants to give that information back to their patients, they're infringing on our patent. And they must redact that information. They cannot give that out. Only we can give that out. 
And so they were sued. And it went to the court, and the court said, you can't patent the gene like that. And so uh, it looked like the ACL1 had, had won. Uh, then they appealed it, and the, the higher court said, oh, yes, you can. You can patent that gene. We have to. So they took it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, I don't know, let's send it back to the lower court. Let's have them look over it one more time, which they did. And they said, I don't think we made a mistake. You can patent the gene. So it's probably going to go back to the Supreme Court. But, you know, a big controversy even there. But that's not the controversy that I want to tell you about. Let me tell you about how this test works, okay? So usually this test is only indicated in women that have a history, some kind of history of breast cancer running in the family. So number one, it's recommended for people that already have some idea they might be at elevated risk of breast cancer. Just keep that in mind. Um, so if you're indicated to take this test, you'd send them some DNA and deep breath. If you're of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, now this is because of the way these SNP patterns and variations are different in different populations. If you're of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, they would look for these three different variants because these are the main ones that lead to disruptions in BRCA1 and 2. If you're not of Ashkenazi Jewish descent or if they don't find those mutations, they would look at all of your BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes and they would try to find any kind of large genomic rearrangements. If they find some kind of a deleterious uh, information and you're of Ashkenazi Jewish descent and you had someone in your family that had breast cancer under the age of 50 but not more than one relative and no ovarian cancer, then your risk of getting breast cancer under the age of 50 would be 38.3%. <laughs> but if you're not of Ashkenazi Jewish descent and you've had someone in your family that had ovarian cancer at any age but no breast cancer under the age of 50, then your risk of getting breast cancer under the age of 50 is 16.9%. And that's how that works. So, <laughs> take home messages, it's complicated. It's complicated. Um, they're looking at uh, rare variants. These are not common variants. And hereditary breast cancer only explains about 5% of all breast cancer. So, uh, unlike some early commercials about this, if you do take this test, and found that you don't have any of these uh, mutations that they're looking for, it doesn't mean that you're safe. It means you, you have the background um, frequency of getting breast cancer or the background likelihood to get breast cancer, which at this point is, is one in eight. But you don't have an increased risk of getting breast cancer. That's true. Um, it's recommended to test if there's a family history of breast cancer. And so an important question to ask is, does it tell you more than you already know by having a family history of breast cancer? <clears throat> now, when I was putting this, this presentation together a few years ago, um, I found this, this phrase in, in their, on their website, the risk of developing cancer that is associated with BRCA1 and 2 is not known. And I thought that was rather unusual for a breast cancer test. Um, I, didn't, I didn't find this statement in their literature anymore, but uh, it's, it is complicated, let's say that. It is complicated. And it's not recommended for women under 18 years of age. Can you imagine why that might be? Anyone? So they don't recommend it for people that are under the age of 18 because at this point, having that information uh, <coughs> would not change any treatment or, or recommend any different therapy for them. And this is another important point. If someone was going to have a late stage onset disease, on a, something like Huntington's disease that affects you later in life, but you could clearly diagnose it when they were born. Would you want to tell that person that? You know, what are the ethics of telling somebody that? Uh, you know, because if there's nothing you can do about it, then it just creates a kind of burden, at least in some people's mind. So is this information actionable? That's probably the most important point. Let's say if you're an adult and you get this, is it actionable? So what does Myriad recommend are the benefits of testing? Well, um, certainly you could have um, uh, increased surveillance. Increased, yeah, increased surveillance. 
But I would imagine, I'm not a doctor, but I would imagine that in counseling your patient that has a family history of breast cancer, you might want to have increased surveillance anyway. Um, then, you know, there's treatments like mastectomy. And um, that's certainly a treatment that reduces risk by 90%. Um, ovarian cancer is highly linked to this locus as well, so some uh, women choose to have ovaries removed as well. But, you know, there's not a whole lot else besides these kinds of radical treatments of things that you could do differently. So, you know, here there are some kinds of surgical procedures that you could take, but an important concept in all of this is, you know, is this information actionable? Because if it's not actionable, it might just be deterministic. In other words, it just tells you what you're going to get. You're going to get cystic fibrosis. You're going to get uh, Alzheimer's. But if there's nothing you can do about it, it's just deterministic and it's not actionable. So here's Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's actually does have a genetic uh, variant that is highly associated. It gives you a very high risk of getting Alzheimer's. So, you know, on your two chromosomes, if you have two copies of this particular variant, you have a very elevated risk of getting Alzheimer's. So a guy at Harvard named Robert Green did some studies and wanted to see what would happen, what, what people would think, you know, about getting this kind of test. Because this genetic test has excellent analytical valid validity and clinical validity. Um, there's no treatment, so there's no market pressure, but there's no treatment. It's a terrifying disease. And the question is, uh, would people still want to know their risk? Now, bioethicists, of course, uh, consider questions like this all the time. And almost with one voice, the bioethicists would say, this is a good example where we don't want to test. Testing. Testing is not recommended. Genetic testing for Alzheimer's disease not appropriate. That's because, you know, in the medical profession they want to do no harm. That's the first thing. And if you can't do any good, then why do harm? So ethically it's say no. So they did, they took these people, they, you know, gave them informed consent, tried to explain what this was all about. And some people were positive for this uh, variant that predisposed them to Alzheimer's. Some of them were negative. Some of them, they didn't return the results. And they gave them some kind of an anxiety test. I don't know how these things work, but some kind of test to see their anxiety at some point after the test. And uh, even a year after the test, they couldn't really find a difference between uh, the anxiety level of people that took this test and were positive um, ones that took it and were negative. Maybe some s increase, a little bit increase in the beginning. Uh, they asked the people, would you take this test again, knowing what you know? And even the people here that were positive for the disease, uh, positive for the genetic variant, I'll say, uh, they all said yes. Almost everybody said they would take this again. Um, people were willing to pay, you know, $100, $500, up to $1,000 to take this test again, knowing there's no treatment and it's only, it's only kind of deterministic information. Now they also studied these groups and they tried to figure out if they made any lifestyle changes because you think, well you can make some lifestyle changes. Um, when I talk to uh, my friends in the medical field, they often tell me that it's very hard uh, to convince people to make lifestyle changes. Even though often this is recommended as the first line, if you have hypertension within a certain region, you know, high blood pressure, they recommend you make lifestyle changes. But uh, I think it's very hard for people to make those lifestyle changes. So would genetic deterministic information push people more to make these lifestyle changes? The answer is not really. <laughs> so here's the people, here's the control group, here's the people that were positive. They did make some lifestyle changes. Um, these guys did a little bit less lifestyle changing. Uh, things like vitamins, exercise, medication. So they did a little bit of that. One thing that they did do significantly is they took out uh, long-term coverage on their life insurance. So again, you know, when we think about the impact of genomics on society, let's say, there's the health side, there's an ethical side, there's a legal side that I touched on briefly, and there is a whole like financial side. Which yes? Point don't you think 
that life insurance is going to require that in the future? Good question. So what about life insurance? <laughs> so so this, is, uh, this is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008. Um, so I don't know if everyone's aware of this, but, but uh, you should be. So this was signed into law by President Bush. Um, and the bill passed the Senate unanimously in the House by a vote of 414 to 1. <laughs> Now, I don't know who this one guy was. I would put his genome on the internet. <laughs> so what does Gina do? What does Gina do for you? So Gina um, prohibits health insurers and health plan administers, administrators from requesting or requiring genetic information um, for using decisions about uh, coverage, rates, and pre-existing conditions. And it prohibits most employers from using genetic information for hiring, firing, promotion, and any decisions regarding terms of employment. So that's what <laughs> that's what Gina should do. Uh, what Gina won't do, okay, is uh, it, the protections do not extend to life insurance, disability insurance, or long-term care insurance. It doesn't apply to employers with fewer than 15 employees. And it does not prohibit health insurers or health plan administrators from obtaining and using genetic test results and making health insurance payment determinations. <laughs> so I don't exactly know what the difference is between those two. I'm not sophisticated enough. Maybe the SNPs didn't make my intelligence that high. Yes, question? Yes, you could avoid having a genetic test done today. I think what it means is if you get your genetic test done under the health plan, the health plan has that information, and then they can use it. But the health plan can't require you. Mm -hmm. I think that's the final one. Yeah, so, so do you have to have a genetic test done? I, I would just bring this out as a question. Um, so today, Clearly not. Most people don't have their genome sequenced for any reason. But increasingly, um, like I said, this kind of uh, genome-wide sequencing is, uh, is going to appear more and more in the clinic. So especially for people that have cancer, um, will likely, in the very near future, uh, when you come to a clinic with cancer, they're going to take a, a biopsy of your tumor and a biopsy of your normal cells, and they're going to look at the differences in, in the genome. There's going to be a lot of people that have genetic diagnoses that are going to have this whole exome sequencing done to determine different kinds of uh, genetic conditions. And researchers would like to use this information de-identified um, to study disease and try to understand disease better. So in the at the university, well, let's say the uh, research level, um, it's very attractive to try to think that if we could sequence more people, we could get a better window on disease and understand it more because knowing just a f little bit of information doesn't tell you enough. Yes? How accurate are these genetic tests? Yeah, how accurate are the yes. genetic tests? Good question. So, so the, the question is, um, how accurate are these genetic tests and does it matter who does it? So um, I guess, yeah, it matters who does it. And uh, like any other medical test, uh, medical tests that rise to the level of clinical rigor um, and considered to be used for the clinic uh, are highly regulated. And sequencing is no different. So there is a, a, a medical standard called CLIA, which stands for something. Um, and uh, only DNA sequencing that is CLIA certified uh, is able to be used for making clinical decisions. And CLIA certification is uh, you know, some kind of accreditation. They look at the analytical validity of the test, its reproducibility, whether the people doing the test have proper training, um, if the equipment is maintained, all the questions you have about the analytical validity, uh, that takes care of that part. But that's not enough. <laughs> so, so like I said, for single gene disorders, it's probably highly, you can probably make very good predictions 
about that information. Uh, so that, that would be very useful. Um, the information that I'm suggesting is probabilistic, like that breast cancer test, can give you an increased risk of a disease, but it doesn't tell you that you're going to get the disease. Now that, it's not clear what the value of that is. And even today, uh, I think most uh, people in, in, in the medical field would say, I don't know what it means. Maybe it's helpful, maybe it's not, but, you know, we're swimming in a sea of information. Let's not worry about it for now. Uh, let's worry about the things we know. Let's worry about all the genetic tests that give us information that we can use. Not worry about how to interpret things that we don't really know yet. Um, so there's an analytical validity, yes, it's accurate. Uh, is it accurately going to tell you what disease you're going to get? That's also not clear. In some cases, yes, and in many cases, no. And in many cases, I hope, we will learn more as time goes on. So actually, I'm just going to end on that. So um, genetic information such as pharmacogenomics, Mendelian disorders, cancer mutations can be clinically useful and actionable. In other cases, it's just deterministic. Um, probabilistic genomic information is harder to interpret and might never be predictive. Now we might learn a lot more about this as time goes on, as we sequence more people, as we get more information. You know, I told you that some of these things, as much information as they have, only explains 10% of the disease. But you know, once you start to put them into pathways and do your systems biology and all this stuff, we might learn more. So this might clear up, or it might not. There is this concept of the incidentalome, which is that when you sequence people, you find that all genomes carry some mutations that could lead to disease. And right now, you know, what if, you, what if someone comes into the Mind Institute and they want to understand if, if they have a, a gene that causes Angelman syndrome? So they do a whole genome analysis on them and they find that gene, yeah, they have Angelman syndrome, but they also have that gene that's going to predispose them to Alzheimer's. Now they didn't come in asking about Alzheimer's. Should you tell them? Do you have an obligation to tell them now that you found it? They make an analogy between a, a chest x-ray. If someone comes in, they, they have pneumonia, you know, the doctor does a chest x-ray and, you know, to see if they have pneumonia. Maybe they find a lump somewhere. You know, now they say, well, I did this thing and an incidental finding, they might have cancer. So you might want to refer them, say, you know, you better get this checked out, you have cancer. So that's an incidental finding. But, you know, again, the counter argument is most of the time you do a chest x-ray, you're not going to find cancer. In genomics, it appears you will always find something in somebody's genome. And so what do we do about this? You know, what do we want to do about this? Uh, but many people will still want to know, despite the risks that the bioethicists would tell us about. Companies like 23andMe are doing this. They're going to do it more. There's going to be other places. They're going to be doing it cheaper. You know, when, when the street value of a genome is $1,000, it's not going to be that much. I would do it. I'd do it. I don't know if I would put it in my medical record. Yes? <laughs> I have another question, if I may. <clears throat> um, all genomes uh, carry some mutations. Does that mean that you may have a test um, this year, and then in three or four years' time, you repeat the test, and there's a difference? Or does it mean that these are random mutations that occur? I, I'm not too sure if I understand that really for you. Yeah. Um, so it's not that the genes will change over time. It's yeah. that um, you can see that people have some kind of mutation that somewhere in the literature somebody has said causes a gene, causes a disease. So when Jim Watson of Watson and Crick fame, the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, um, he was the first individual person to have his genome sequenced. And they found that there were a couple of genes that seemed to be mutated that would have caused him to have a couple of diseases that he didn't have. And we're trying to understand that. Uh, part of it is due to the fact that some of those annotations, some of those pieces of information were, you know, because you see there's a mutation. The question is, what does it do? And someone somewhere in the past said that causes this mutation, but that might be wrong. 
And a lot of that information um, might need to be right. Not a lot of it, maybe some of it, right? But um, let's say we have a long way to go in a lot of different parts of this. But we also think of mutations as being negative. They may also have some positive impact on us that we don't know. That's right, there could be some X-Men out there. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, we'll find them too, I suppose. How much variation is there between cells within a single individual, as far as from when the first egg starts splitting, how much testing a finger cell on one hand and a toe cell on the other hand, or something like that, how much variation occurs is from the mutation within yourself? Yeah, that, that's a good question. That's a good question. I mean, you, you'd like to believe that the genome that started at one cell is the same genome that we have at, a, at 100 trillion cells, but that might not be true. So certainly for some cells, it's not true. There's also um, different kinds of epigenetic events that can occur, which can lead to some genetic rearrangement, let's say not wholesale genetic rearrangement like you'd see in cancer. So everything doesn't go crazy. But you can see some genetic differences, you know, say even between two different neurons uh, might have slight differences in their DNA. Whether that makes a physical change, a phenotypic change, is not clear. And the extent of that, you know, you'd have to really sample tissues in a lot of different places, do that in a lot of people. I'm not aware of that answer. Okay. But, that you could think, but you could think about how you could do that. Mm -hmm. And so you probably, if, if we don't have the answer already, we'll have it soon. <laughs> I'm concerned about the uh, patenting process of uh, genes. Uh, very much concerned about that. I might have to increase my uh, support of the ACLU. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I claim no affiliation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, I have a difficult time uh, grasping it because uh, to me, it occurs in nature. And just like iron or any atom or an electron or how can you patent those? I know uh, that you can patent processes uh, and, and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but um, I don't know how you can patent the gene. And maybe I misunderstood the court case that you cited. So I've listened to some of the arguments in the court cases, and they do talk on this, this kind of language. And actually, um, a lot of the argument seems to center around whether when they make a copy of this gene in order to do the genetic test on it, whether now that they've made this copy that that's still your gene, that they've made a new chemical entity. And they, they argue about whether this is a new chemical entity that it is not found in nature, it's only found because we made it there and now we're testing that thing. Now, to me, this whole line of reasoning misses the point completely. We don't care about the chemical entity. We only care about the information. We only care about what it says. It doesn't matter if you make a copy with a Xerox machine or a photograph. All we care about is what it says. So I disagree with the whole arguments that are being presented before the court. But I'm not the lawyers. And they have their angle. But let, OK, so let me. Let me and the judges don't have PhDs. <laughs> Let me, let me just make the case for the, for the, uh, the biotech industry. Um, they would probably say uh, that it's not so much that they want to patent the gene. The point is that to make those charts that I showed you with all those percentages and things took a lot of research. Okay, so you know, your genetic se sequence, you could sequence it, you'll see it. But you don't know what it means. And they figured out what it means. So that's the thing that they say you know, needs to be protected. So when people do this genetic test, you know, it took them many years to figure that out, and now anybody can sequence it, and if they don't have patent protection, then everybody just knows what they know, and, uh, you know, they've just given away everything that they have. There's no need for Myriad to exist. Some people would say there is no point. We need to keep funding public research. Keep funding public research. I like that. I like that. I like that. By the way, there's donation information on the back of those pamphlets. <laughs> well, there's also ethical implications of the public-private partnerships. You know, that's something to get into probably in another conversation. But the ethical implications of it, UC Davis is doing research in cooperation with who's owning the patents. And Conflicts of interest, Conflicts yeah. Conflicts of interest, I think, are a major issue in this area. Right, right. Not you. Naturally. <laughs> Naturally not me. Yes. I think I'm interested in having my my genome coded, and uh, 
But I'm concerned about potential risks, for example, identity, identity theft. Um, you seem to uh, feel favorably about even having your own genome sequence. And I was wondering, what are the risks that you can think of that I should, that we should be, anybody in this room should be aware of if they're interested in having a genome? Well, um, if, if you're having your genome sequenced through um, some kind of a university study somewhere or a medical study, all of those kinds of uh, research, so all of those kinds of environments will be highly regulated. So I'll just tell you that. Um, every <coughs> genetic study that involves humans for research has to go through an institutional <coughs> review board, which is mandated, and they s carefully study the bioethics the risk versus benefit of that study, how the information will be protected. And so all of that is, is under tight regulation by university uh, institutional review boards, which is overseen by the federal government. So, so you should know that going into a genetic study that's involved in research. And clinical use of that genetic information will have similar safeguards. Um, 